So now what we're going to do is we're going to go through each of the three kinds of mass collaborations that I had described before. So the first is human computation. I think if there's one thing in my book that I would change, it would be this word. Because this word actually has a definition, and I'm not following that definition. And that is bad. Almost every other word in the book does not have a clear definition. So human computation, when many people think of human computation, they think of Louis Vaughan's definition of you know, using humans to do things that computers can't yet do well. When I think of human computation, I think of kind of a subset of that. Um, so things where the task is easy, but the scale is big. So think about Galaxy Zoo, labeling those galaxies. The task is easy. The problem comes from the scale. Naturally, if you have easy tasks that need to be done over and over again, usually you think you could have a computer do those, right? If you're adding up a bunch of numbers by hand, that's easy, but if you have a lot of numbers, it becomes hard. Uh, computers though, are really good at adding up numbers. But there are some of these tasks that are easy for humans, but hard for computers. And these are the ones um, that we would think would make sense for this kind of human computation project. So for some things, computers are much better than humans. And for some things, humans are much better than computers. So that's the space that we want to be in for this kind of approach. And um, as some of the examples showed, this kind of thing of having humans do a bunch of uh, simple tasks, the most common setting, I think, will become, this will become more common in social science as we move to these newer forms of data. So we've talked about text in the past, uh, images, movies, audio. These kinds of things, computers are getting better at processing them for sure. Um, but for a lot of social research, I think for the foreseeable future, humans will be better at extracting information from them than computers for certain kinds of tasks. So as social researchers, as we move away from survey data into these richer forms of data, uh, I think we'll see increasingly things where we want to bring humans in to do stuff. And then that human effort can be magnified and amplified with supervised learning. So we have humans create some training set, then we build a model that can then label the rest of the unlabeled images or text. So I think the earliest versions of these human computation it was like all human effort. And now I think much more people are designing them in a way to combine human effort with machine effort. But the human effort has to be there to create the training data. Does everyone know what I, just to clarify, supervised learning, does everyone, so let me just, so you have a bunch of pictures of, let's say, cats and dogs, and then you have some example, the labels where they say this is a cat, this is a cat, this is a dog. You build some model that learns the relationship between the picture and the label, and then you use that model to do everything else. So another version of supervised learning, you could say it's predicting which kids will go to college. You have a bunch of demographic information, you have outcomes from some kids, whether they went to college or not, you fit a logistic regression, then you use that logistic regression to predict what other kids will do. That is also a supervised learning. It just doesn't sound as cool as cats and dogs. Uh, so it's not, in other words, for the social scientists who have not taken a course in machine learning, it's not qualitatively different than a logistic regression model. Um, OK, so whoops. So oh, I want to tell you about this one paper, which the title's not here. Uh, it's a secret paper. Um, this is the one about crowdsourcing text coding. And I'll tell you why I really like this paper. Um, so this was the one in political science. I think the first author is Ken Benoit. So here's sort of how the paper begins. Empirical social science often relies on data that are not observed, but are transformed into quantitative variables by expert researchers. So this is like, we have some, in this case, text. We don't analyze the text directly. Often we have experts label that text or do some kind of transformation to that text. And then we analyze those labels or transformations. Well, generally considered the most valid way of producing data, the expert-driven process is inherently difficult to replicate or assess on the grounds of reliability. Using crowdsourcing to distribute those texts for reading and interpretation we generate results comparable to those by experts, uh, but far more uh, 
quickly and flexibly. And um, so let me tell you why I like the way that they did. So here in this paper, basically, they take a bunch of political manifestos that have been coded by experts. They put them on something like Mechanical Turk to be coded again by non-experts. But what I like about their paper is they don't justify this by saying this is cheaper. They argue that this is actually better. And they argue it's better because it's more reproducible and it's more flexible. And so the way that they see it, the experts are a bug and not a feature. So right, often we think experts, we need experts. Experts are good, we need experts. This paper is really good at flipping that logic around and saying, no, experts are not good. Experts are not good because they're hard to access, they're not flexible, and it's hard to assess the reliability of experts. So they argue that we're actually better off moving away from experts. And so to what other problems now are there where we think we need experts to do these tasks where you could actually do better by having lots and lots of non-experts? So I think one question that comes up a lot for people doing human computation is whether to use Mechanical Turk to collect these labels. So in Galaxy Zoo, they did not. It's more of treating the people as collaborators. So initially, I wanted to have no, I wanted to have this whole chapter be full of collaborator examples and not cog examples. But then someone convinced me that's not realistic. So I do think, like, if you wanted to do something like Galaxy Zoo, the idea of creating an entire community of people around your project is very difficult, and a lot of these things could very naturally also be done on Turk. Any questions about this kind of human computation, taking a big problem, splitting it up, have people do the work on each part, and then combining what they do? Yeah? Well, so you said at the beginning you kind of wanted to focus the whole discussion on collaborators versus widgets and cogs, and this seems like a widgets and cogs approach. I don't know. Yeah, I so this, uh, this paper is definitely a widgets and cogs approach. So I, I feel this tension because I want to not have a widgets and cogs approach, like Galaxy Zoo. They do not have that. They treat those people as collaborators. Uh, but if you want to actually do something in the world quickly and have a high chance of success, I think you're much more likely to actually get something done using the widgets and cogs approach. So I've talked about that because if I only told you the Galaxy Zoo style approach, I think I would be, that would be not the most helpful thing I could do. So I have the thing that I think is the coolest, but there's this other thing that's much more likely to be successful, and I should also tell you about that too. Does that seem reasonable? Other questions? Okay.